I am not a reader of history. I know some of you are looking at me aghast. <clears throat> if I had to sit down and read a history book or a novel, I'd choose the novel every time. I like the fiction <laughs> rather than the reality. <clears throat> That's a confession, I guess. The trouble is that I think in matters of religion, I'm not alone in that tendency. I believe there are a number of people that prefer the fiction to the reality. Especially when we get to talking about eschatology. Now, eschatology is not, and don't, don't let the word throw you off, okay? I had to call it something. We recognize the, the end of the word anyway. Ology is the study of something. And eschatology is simply the study of last things. It has to do with the end of the world, with the coming of Jesus, things like that. And in this matter, the religious world as a whole, when we're talking about uh, those who deem themselves Christians, they have chosen fiction over reality. It makes a great fictional story to talk about, just for example, the idea of the rapture. <clears throat> that suddenly, unexpectedly, every faithful Christian on the face of the earth is going to disappear. So when you get on an airplane, you pray that your pilot is not a faithful Christian in case the rapture happens. Uh, it's fiction. It does not come from the Word of God. You cannot get it from the Word of God. You have to be helped to understand that fictional idea. That somehow all faithful Christians will disappear and it will usher in a, a time of tribulation. It's true that Matthew chapter 24 speaks about a time of tribulation that will be worse than had ever been or will be after it. But it is quite clear from Matthew 24 that that is in the context of the fall of Jerusalem that happened in A.D. 70, that it would happen in that generation. You have to have help to misunderstand that. That's what we're talking about in this series of lessons on false doctrines that we face. And tonight we want to talk about one of the, the major false doctrines. This is the issue of premillennialism. Premillennialism is a fiction, but it's the kind of fiction you could make movies out of, you know, like Left Behind series of movies, and, and they did make movies about it's And it's fiction. It does not come from the Word of God. The word premillennialism simply says that in the, in the school of thought, there is a millennium that Jesus is going to reign here on the earth and that it's going to be a time of peace and prosperity. There won't be wars. There won't be any problems like that. And the pre part of it means that Jesus is returning to this earth before that millennium starts. Now, there's a less believed thought uh, post-millennialism that believes that at some point the earth will enter into a thousand year period, a millennium of peace and prosperity, and that Jesus will come at the end of that millennium. That's post-millennialism. Here's the problem. The Bible does not teach a literal thousand year reign of Jesus. Not in any place. But this is very, very prevalent in the minds of many people. And we want to go through some of the problems with this idea of premillennialism because it is so prevalent. Because the people who come and knock on your door believe in premillennialism. They're going to be telling you Jesus is coming soon and he's going to establish his reign here on the earth and he's going to reign for a thousand years and don't you want to be part of that wonderful kingdom? And the mainstream denominations those who consider themselves evangelicals and so forth have all bought into this theory of premillennialism. I even heard a Catholic scholar, uh, David Sungenis, one time recommend that in his thought, the Catholic Church should go back and re-examine this idea that maybe they had missed the truth that the Bible teaches about the coming millennium. 
It is that prevalent in our world. And many of the people that you will talk to from day to day about religious things will have been impressed by this false doctrine and the drama of it. And they will ask you questions. Do you, do you think that Jesus is coming soon to establish his kingdom? Or what do you think about what's going on in the world around us? It sounds like it's the time of tribulation or leading up to that and on and on. And these are things that we need to be aware of because they are so prevalent. Now, there is a less prevalent doctrine that has invaded the Lord's church in the past couple decades. It's not new. It did several decades ago. But and that is this idea of realized eschatology, that everything the Bible says about the end or the last times has already been realized, and that we are looking forward to nothing, that there will never be. We'll talk about that more as we go. We're just going to deal with that very quickly for a few minutes toward the end of this lesson. First, we want to deal with premillennialism and several objections to it. Turn your Bibles, please. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles with several of these uh, so that we can look at what the, the scripture actually says in contrast to what people teach. Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 7. Some of this we've already gone through in a class together uh, several months ago when I was new here and we began our classes again. Uh, but it's important that we deal with this because of the prevalence of this false doctrine. Revelation 20, beginning in, in verse 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed for a little season. This passage, and going on down through verse 7, is the only passage in Scripture that mentions the thousand years, the millennium, and Jesus reigning for a thousand years. It's the only passage that mentions it at all. And I want you to notice that, first of all, the book of Revelation was given to us in symbols. Secondly, there are... This passage is clearly not a literal passage. What literally is a bottomless pit? A chain that's big enough to bind the dragon, the old serpent. Remember early in Revelation, he's pictured as he can take a third of the stars out of heaven with his tail. That's how big he is. So how big is this chain? The dragon is not real, not literal as a dragon, as a serpent. The chain is not literal. The, bo the bottomless pit is not literal. None of these things are literal. Why would we make the assumption that the thousand years here has to be a literal thousand years? In fact, as it talks to us about the reign of Jesus, we have a very, very simple answer to this false doctrine that all of us should have in our minds. In John 18 and verse 36, when Pilate asked Jesus if he's a king, Jesus answered and says, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to you. But now is it not from hence? We are not looking for a literal thousand year reign of Jesus here on the earth. The Bible simply does not teach such a thing. And this is clearly a figurative passage. So the first objection that I have to the doctrine of premillennialism is that it twists Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 7, to come up with the idea that there's a literal millennium at all. That is why, instead of being a post-millennialist or a premillennialist, I am an amillennialist. You recognize that prefix there as a prefix of denial. I don't believe that there is a literal thousand year reign. And we'll see more of why that is as we go through this. Second objection to premillennialism is that it demotes Christ. Turn your Bibles please to Acts chapter 2. One of the reasons that I ask you to do this with your Bibles I mean, I could go and I could read it and you could sit and listen. But I know how Sunday nights are. And I'd like you to stay awake 
And the more active you are, the more likely you are to stay awake, okay? Uh, so turn your Bibles, please, to, uh, to Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 30, speaking about David in verse 29, and calling David a prophet in verse 30, therefore being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He, seeing this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, which he has shed forth, which ye now see and hear, for David is not ascended unto the heavens, but he saith unto him, or, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. From Psalm 1, uh, 110 and verse 1. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. What's he saying? Jesus was raised up to sit on his throne. And being, not that he's going to be someday, being by the right hand of God exalted, sitting here at the right hand of God until his foes are made his footstool. Jesus is already reigning on his throne. That's why I don't believe in a literal thousand year reign. He is seated on God's right hand. Colossians chapter 3. And verse 1, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Clear fulfillment of Psalms 110 and verse 1. He now has all authority. How could he be, reigned, uh, be crowned as king someday if he now has all authority? Matthew 28 and verse 18, all power is given me in heaven and in earth. In fact, think about this. And how Christ would be demoted with the idea of a kingdom. Look at Hebrews chapter 8, please. In Hebrews chapter 8, we find out that if Jesus were here on earth, he should not be a priest. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 4. For if he were on earth, he should not be a priest, seeing that there are priests that offer gifts according to the law. So he would be demoted from his priesthood. He would be taken off his throne in order to come here and reign here on the earth. First Corinthians chapter 15, if you want to look at that real quickly. First Corinthians chapter 15, beginning in verse 22, explains to us that when Jesus returns, he will return after all of his enemies have been destroyed and the final enemy is death. He will Deliver the kingdom back to the Father. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 22 says, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom unto God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. In Christ shall all, be man, all men be made alive. That last enemy is destroyed. Jesus will deliver the kingdom back to the Father. Does that mean he won't be God anymore? He's certainly God. But he won't be reigning as the king. God will be all in all. That's one of the things that Paul explains here in this passage. It would demote Christ. The literal return of Christ to earth could not add anything to him who already has all authority in heaven and earth. His physical, literal return would cancel his office as our holy high priest. Bringing it, one man said it this way, bringing him back to earth and placing him in a literal throne in Jerusalem would be more than the equivalent of demoting a five-star general to the grade of private. That's a quote from Burton Kaufman. So it twists Revelation 20, 1 through 7, and it demotes Jesus Christ. Thirdly, objections to premillennialism, it demeans the church. Now, 
you have to be careful here because not every person who believes in premillennialism in a coming kingdom believes exactly the same thing. There are different flavors of it and it's hard to know exactly what you're dealing with. But many who believe in premillennialism dealing with the fact that John the baptizer came, Matthew chapter 3, preaching that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Remember? They say that well, yeah, when Jesus came to this earth, he came with the idea of establishing his kingdom, his, his thousand year reign. But the tide of public opinion turned against him. And instead of making him a king, they crucified him. So as a stopgap measure, he established the church. And he went back to heaven to wait until the world was ready for him to finally come and establish his kingdom. I'm not making this up. This is Hal Lindsey and the late great planet Earth and, and so forth. The problem is that the church was in the mind of God through all eternity. The problem is that the church was not an afterthought. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 21, to him be glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Back in verse 10, he says it's by the church that the manifold wisdom of God would be made known or manifested. In Acts 20 and verse 28, the Ephesian elders were told to feed the flock of God, which he purchased with his own blood. It was not an afterthought. Here's an interesting question, though. What if Jesus had been successful when he first came to establish his kingdom? What if they had not crucified him? What if they had accepted him as king and he began his thousand year reign? How would we be saved? How would we be justified and sanctified as we've been preaching on Sunday mornings? How, where would be our propitiation, appeasing the anger of God if Jesus had been successful the first time he came, according to their doctrine, we would not have any hope of salvation. Absolutely none. Because he never would have been hanged on a cross. And of course there is in this doctrine, demeaning the church, a failure to recognize that the church and the kingdom are the same thing here on earth. I realize that the boundaries of the kingdom extend farther than just the church. That Abraham and Isaac and Jacob come and sit down within the kingdom, Jesus said. But on earth, right now, the church is the kingdom. It is God's reign in the hearts of men. In Matthew 16 and verse 18, Jesus said, I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. That's a non sequitur. If we don't understand that the church and the kingdom are the same thing. But the church and the kingdom are indeed the same thing. Premillennialism <clears throat> weakens the concept of the judgment day. Premillennialists believe that when Jesus returns to set up his kingdom, people will be given a second chance. Again, you have to be helped to have that understanding from Scripture. It does not come from Scripture. It comes from people choosing drama and fiction over what God has clearly revealed. When Christ comes again, it will not be to convert anybody. He will be taking vengeance on them that know not God and obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. He will be judging people. Matthew chapter 12, verses 47 and 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word. Verse 47, he says, I came not to judge the world. Because the first time he came, he didn't come as judge. He came as Savior. When he comes again, 
He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. When Jesus comes again, it will not be to judge or to convert anyone, but to judge the ungodly sinners who have rejected his gospel. And then another objection to premillennialism is that it misunderstands the idea of the last days in Scripture. This one you may hear from people when you're at work, people are talking, do you believe it's the last days? And you got to be careful how you answer that because the correct answer is yes, I believe it's the last days. But not for the same reasons you believe that. Not because we're, we're about to get into a... And I'm not predicting here. I'm talking the way people think. Okay, we're about to get into a, a, a nuclear war with Russia, or you know, and it's not. There's nothing in our world that points to those last days in that sense. The signs that Jesus referred to in Matthew 24 were all things that were going to occur in that century, connected with the fall of Jerusalem. But the Bible does teach that we're in the last days. Premillennialism has a misunderstanding of what that means, the last days. Acts chapter 2. Turn your Bibles there, please. I know I get going here and I forget to say turn your Bibles there and give you time to do that. But I want you to stay awake, so turn your Bibles back to Acts chapter 2, please. <clears throat> Again, this is pre Peter preaching on Pentecost. Verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea and ye that dwell in Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words, for these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing that it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. <coughs> your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens will I pour out in those days of my spirit. And they shall prophesy. The last days is when Peter says this was fulfilled. Peter believed that he was in the last days when he preached this particular Sermon. Look at Hebrews chapter 1. <clears throat> Verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past to the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds in these last days. In Second Peter, which is just a couple of books over here, Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. But especially look with me, please, at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that I think gives us an explanation or an understanding of what is meant by this phrase, the last days. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 11, remember he has just listed for them the sins that caused Israel to fall in the wilderness, their fornication, their idolatry, their lusting, their tempting God, all of those things. And he says, in verse 11, now all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We live in the last age, the last age that will ever be with this earth. When this age ends, this earth ends. And so we are in the last days. We have been in the last days since Jesus died on the cross and the gospel was ushered in on the day of Pentecost. And we will be in the last days until he returns. How long is that going to be? Well, it's not a thousand years. We're already past 2,000. We're getting close. Remember that Jesus said, 
in Mark chapter 9 and verse 1, there'll be some of you standing here which shall not taste of death till you see the kingdom of God come with power. Remember that, Jesus, or that Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, he talked about Jesus who hath translated, or God who hath translated us out of the power of darkness and delivered us, delivered us out of the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. The kingdom has been in existence since Jesus established the church. And we live in those last days. We live in the millennium, but it's not a literal millennium. It's not a literal thousand years. We live in the last days. <clears throat> Let's go on and look at some objections to the AD 70 theory. I want to take just a minute to explain what this is because it is affecting the Lord's church in various places and you may go and visit somewhere and, and hear this doctrine taught at some point. Um, <clears throat> the basic claim of the AD 70 theory is that it denies there's any, any prophecy that deals with the future. That every prophecy that the Bible has given has already been fulfilled. That the final prophecies, the prophecies that do with last things, were all fulfilled in the year AD 70, when the Roman army came and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple there in Jerusalem. That is the doctrine that is being taught. Therefore, it denies that there is any future second coming of Jesus. It says that his coming and all the prophecies about his coming will fulfill when Jerusalem fell. It denies the resurrection. That there will be a day of resurrection when when. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Uh, John chapter 5. It denies that this earth will be destroyed. In fact, AD 70 uh, proponents teach very plainly that this physical world will last forever. It will never be destroyed. They deny what 2 Peter chapter 3 teaches about this. And it denies that there will be a day of judgment. There are some who hold this doctrine that believe everyone is going to be saved. There are some who hold this doctrine that believe each one is judged as soon as they die. But it denies that there is coming a day of judgment. Let me just mention a couple of things about this without going into it in any great detail. <clears throat> First, if the AD 70 theory was true, there would be no reason for us to partake of the Lord's Supper anymore. 1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26. As oft as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. If we're not showing the Lord's death till he come, why would we be partaking of this Lord's Supper? I would point out to you secondly that there would be no more marriage. Turn your Bibles over to Mark chapter 12, please. In Mark chapter 12, beginning in verse 18, the Sadducees came to Jesus. They had a question for him. They, they were going to stump him. They had their conundrum that they figured he couldn't answer because they denied there was a resurrection. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection, but the Sadducees denied it, and they wanted to stump Jesus with this question. Their question was, here's a man. Mary's a woman. He dies. His brother marries her according to the law of Moses, he dies. His brother marries, and, and seven of them, seven brothers marry this woman, and they all die, and last of all, the woman dies. The question is, now whose wife is she going to be in the judgment, in the resurrection? Verse 23, in the resurrection, therefore, when they shall rise, whose wife shall she be of them? For the seven had her to wife. And Jesus answering said unto him, Do you not therefore err, because you know not the Scriptures, neither the power of God? For when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. And as touching the, the dead that they rise, have you not read in the book of Moses how in the bush that uh, God spake unto him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, 
but the God of the living, ye therefore do greatly err. If we live after the time of the resurrection, no more marriage. No marrying or giving in, giving in marriage. Now, do those who believe in the AD 70 theory have a, a, a way to twist the scripture and try to make it fit? Well, sure. But it's pretty plain what it says. And we don't have to worry about how they twist it. You have to be helped to have a misunderstanding of this. There's coming a time when all will rise and those marriage bonds that we had here on the earth will not mean anything anymore. And we won't be marrying and we won't be giving in marriage when that resurrection happens. If the AD 70 theory were, were true, there would be no promises of Scripture that apply today. Mark 16, 16 is, brothers and sisters, a prophecy. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. If all prophecy was fulfilled in AD 70, that scripture doesn't apply anymore. It's been fulfilled. Every promise of God is still a prophecy. If it's not already been fulfilled, if, if it's to be fulfilled in our lifetimes, it is a prophecy. Unless we change the definition of prophecy. It is a prediction about what will happen given by the authority and foreknowledge of God. Revelation 2 and verse 10, Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Does it apply to us? In a debate within the last two or three years, uh, Brother Howard Denham, a very powerful defendant of the truth in many ways, uh, he uh, asked his opponent who believed in this AD 70 theory to produce one scripture that has application to us today. And through the whole debate, the man never produced one scripture that has application to us today. Why? Because it's all been fulfilled. If it's fulfilled, it's filled full. That's what the meaning is. It's a very, very sad, sad thing that this doctrine has found a, a toehold among those who we would think of as faithful Christians. And it is not a harmless doctrine. One more scripture I want us to look at here. 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> beginning in verse 15. Study or due diligence to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as doth a canker. Paul, can you give us an example of what you're talking about by profane and vain babblings? A word that will eat as doth a canker? He said, yeah, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Well, what is it that they're teaching that is profane and vain babblings that eats as doth a cancer or a canker? He, say, he said, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that, that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. This is not a, a minor, meaningless, false doctrine. Those in Paul's day who claimed that the resurrection was already past were overthrowing the faith of people. Those who are claiming today that the resurrection is past are overthrowing the faith of people. The man that I know best that is involved in this AD 70 thing, one of the strongest proponents of it that they have right now, has gone from his beliefs to the point 
that he no longer believes in an eternal conscious punishment in hell. I think the last time I heard what he had to say about it, he was uh, preaching uh, uh, annihilationism, that we might be punished temporarily and then just be annihilated. But many who hold this doctrine have come to the point of believing that all will be saved. There's nothing in Scripture to condemn anyone today because there's no prophecy that it still applies to us today. Of course, if there's nothing in Scripture to condemn anyone today, there's nothing in Scripture to save anyone today either, which makes it a truly, truly sad thing. Let's emphasize this as we close this lesson. The Bible teaches that there is literally a second coming of Jesus. When those men stood there, looking up into heaven, seeing Jesus rise from this earth, the angel that was standing by told them very plainly, it's not a symbolic passage, it is a historical account. He says, as you have seen him go into heaven, he will return. There is a literal second coming of Christ. There is a literal resurrection in John 5, 28 and verse 29. When all that are in the graves hear his voice and come forth, they that have done good under the resurrection of life and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. There is a literal destruction of this earth. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 3 through 11 makes that very plain, how the, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. He goes on to ask the question, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of of God. There is a literal destruction of this earth someday, and there is a literal day of judgment. In Acts 17, verses 30 and 31, the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10 talks about we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Romans chapter 14, verses 10 through 12. Why dost thou judge thy brother, or dost thou set at naught thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. As it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. There is a day in which this is going to happen. There is a day in which... When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all His holy angels with Him, then shall be gathered all nations. And He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from his goats. And He shall set the sheep on His right hand and the goats on His left. There is a day of judgment that is coming. We need to believe in these things. And we need to hold on to this idea. So what's the, what's the difference What's the difference between me and a premillennialist? What's the difference between you and a Calvinist? Or you and someone who holds the AD 70? What's the difference? It's a difference of who we're listening to. Whether we're following men and their doctrines or following the word of God. I am not here because I'm better than anyone else. I'm not here because I'm smarter than anyone else. I'm not preaching against these false doctrines so that we can get up on a high horse and look down at the rest of the world. Because we are in danger from these false doctrines. We can easily be led astray. We can be deceived. If we do not search the scriptures daily, whether these things are so. This is our responsibility to stand with God in His Word. We're going to sing an invitation song as we always do. In case there is one here who has not been baptized into Jesus for the remission of your sins, you have the opportunity to come and say, I'm ready. I want to give myself to the Lord as He commands. I want to submit to this plan of salvation that He has offered. Maybe that you need to come back to the Lord or whatever your need is. We ask you to come down to the front as together we stand and sing.